Well, friends, if in your infinite wisdom you decide to disregard the manufacturer's instruction for the maintenance of your car, you ought not to be surprised if sooner or later that car of yours breaks down. Your owner manual, your car owner manual, may say certain things like, ensure your, you maintain adequate oil in the engine, water in the cooling system, uh, brake fluid in the line, sufficient air in the tyres. But perhaps in your infinite wisdom you think to yourself, you know, bother with those minor details. Anyway, I have friends who are telling me that the motoring industry have come of age now. This is the 21st century. And no one does those sort of things anymore. I mean, it'll look after itself. I mean, underneath the bonnet, it's got computers now. If we foolishly listen to the counsel of others, of those who really don't understand cars, we will end up in a roadside breakdown. Well, friends, too many marriages today are experiencing a breakdown. And some of that is simply because they haven't done any marriage maintenance. Rather than consulting God's marriage manual, many are listening to the world's counsel and sadly many suffer relationship problems. Think on that well, and tragically, often there is marital and family breakdown. And yet, despite the fact that that is the case, and everybody knows that's the case, still the cry goes out, Who follows those dusty old shins in these modern times anyway? Husbands leading and and providing for their wives. Wives sweetly submitting at home. That's old fashioned. We've come of age today. Today we have equal rights. Today we have careers to pursue. We have a mortgage to pay. And anyway, we've tried this way and it seemed to have worked for us. So don't challenge our thinking. Don't, don't complicate my life with facts. <laughs> Give me equality. Give me what I think works. And often it is, Give me me time. And for God's marriage manual having largely been ignored, even put aside by far too many professed Christians, many are suffering today things that are far worse than a flat tire or a blown head gasket. And they wonder why things aren't running so home, why relationships in the family are so difficult. And for many, lives and probably saddest of all, children are devastated. I think we could say as we come back to Ephesians chapter 5, that as we are looking at these passages, these verses in this study in Ephesians 5, that this is taking us through important marriage maintenance. We want to be reforming our families to God's word and not being conformed to the patterns of the world. Isn't that what we want as Christians? We want to have healthy homes that are rightly and and finely tuned to God's design. Put it a different way. We want to have our tanks full of God's love and God's truth. We want each part of our family relationships lubricated with God's spirit. We want to have marriages and families that are not missing a beat here and there, but are running smoothly, as smoothly as they can for him. And I think in large measure, we don't really care old fashioned or it looks a bit odd because we actually know that God's way is the right way. That living according to his pattern will bring glory to his name no matter what the world says. And it will take us into the blessing of having 
happy home. Friends, this morning as we come back to Ephesians 5, we're moving forward and we're taking up what I'm calling today God's pattern for husbands. And there is too much, as I said several weeks ago in relation to the wives, there is too much to deal with in one sitting here this morning. So we're in what Lord willing will take up again the next time we come back to this passage. But the three things I'd like for us to look at this morning, borrowing something of the similar headings that we used previously, will be these. Firstly, the matter of headship. Secondly, we'll see what the passage says about the model for headship. And then thirdly, we'll begin to look at the manner of headship. So friends, with God's marriage manual, or at least part of it, opened in front of you at Ephesians chapter 5, let's see now what God says to the husbands. Let's come back to our passage, reread from verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is saviour of the body. Therefore, just as he is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So number one here, we're looking at the matter of headship. It says there in verse 23 that the husband is head of the wife. God doesn't command the husband to be head. You see that? He just states that he is that. The husband is head of the wife. Now, of course, we know, as we said this a couple of weeks ago, that such a concept as this that we're speaking of is offensive to a politically correct culture. To a culture that has changed even some of its language in recent years to accommodate the the worldly philosophy of feminism. I personally believe that feminism has permeated so much of today's thinking within our culture and I think it has actually affected us as Christians more than we might even realise. And it is my intention, God willing, after lunch in the adult class that we would take up something a bit more of this theme <clears throat> of feminism and what the Bible has to say in terms of dealing with some of this to the issues it raises. This modern virus, if we could call it that, has even infected contemporary biblical scholarship. So there are such things, <laughs> there are such people who would call themselves Christian feminists. I think, to me, that's an oxymoron, but nevertheless, that's how they would see themselves. And and those people who would have the world's philosophical perspective on roles of of, of male-female in their confused thinking of feminism, yet as Christians who say they want to follow the Bible, they such a passage as this, and obviously they're going to take it uh, and understand it, interpret it differently to how most of us would. And yet, so nevertheless, they would come to this passage and they say, well, Paul here evidently is writing with rabbinic prejudice. He was a Jewish rabbi. And because he was a Jewish rabbi, he writes this, he's writing with that bias, with that lean, with that perspective, and therefore we've got to understand that as we read this. Or clearly Paul was a male chauvinist when you read this passage. Well, I trust you can see any view that rejects these words on that basis is ultimately rejecting the inspiration and the authority of the word of God because in the end it's not Paul that they've got a problem with it's actually the doctrine of scripture and ultimately it's God himself and others of course have tried to excuse this as, as Paul is simply expressing a cultural practice here and so they say well well now our culture is different to that culture And so, therefore, we are not under obligation to follow these words. Well, is that true? If Paul's statement about husband's headship is cold, then what does that do to the next part of the verse? The husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. Is Christ's headship also cultural? 
You see what not that thinking makes of what Paul actually says in this context? And yet if we step back just very briefly, and this is a huge issue, but just step very briefly back and and think of what else Paul says in the New Testament, we know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that Paul shows us that a divinely instituted hierarchy that even relates to male and female is not about culture, but it's actually rooted in the very being of God. If you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll just touch on this for you to see and maybe to think through more yourself uh, later on, but in, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul here in verse 11, he's speaking about a divinely instituted hierarchy. It's in the context of him speaking about male and female in the church at Corinth, so we're not taking it out of context. He says, but I want you to know, verse 3, that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Divinely instituted hierarchy of man and woman is not cultural. It is rooted in the Godhead. And evidently that has nothing to do about someone being superior and someone else inferior. Because the Son is one with the Father. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul ties man's headship in the context of the local church and the place of teaching and instruction and learning in relation to men and women. You remember what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He says in verse 11, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, to, but to be in silence. Now why? Is that cultural? Some want to say that's cultural. That's not Paul's argument. What's he say in the next verse? For here's the reason why he's just said what he said, male headship and women in terms of the church. He says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. He ties it to creation. As we'll see later in our studies in Ephesians 5, not today, future opportunity, God willing. Paul himself ties the marriage relationship back to the Garden of Eden in Ephesians chapter 5. And as we know, the Garden of Eden predates any culture. And so as we come to this concept, this matter of headship, this is God's design. This is not just some cultural practice. And so we don't need to be uh, bullied to think we're not, we've got a wrong idea by some feminist mindset on this. We need to have our minds governed, interpreting the scripture with scripture and understand what Paul is saying. And so here I believe we see Paul places before us this matter of leadership for the husband or headship. The husband is head of the wife. And so what does that mean? What what does that mean for we here today? That's the statement. Matter, what does it mean? Well, we who are husbands. This is the role that we have. And this is our practical stewardship before God. In other words, God has given this to us. This is the role that God has entrusted to us who are husbands. And therefore, we will answer to him as to how we exercise it. And so the question is not, as the feminists might frame it, is there such a thing as headship? That's not the question. Because God simply says, the husband is head of the wife. The question is, is the husband a good head? Or is he a bad head? You see... It's not mere, merely the privilege and right of exercising authority. It's not just uh, men that we wear the uniform and we give the orders. It's not that at all. It means assuming all the responsibilities that go with such a role and function under God. God designed marriage with a seat of authority and rule with a head. And he put us men in the driving seat. He has assigned to men the steward family government. That's what the marriage manual states. We put the manual aside and think we can drive the car our own way. We will soon find we have a breakdown. 
Of course, then the question is whether we as married men are exercising that authority that we do have. Are we doing it in a manner that glorifies God, that benefits our wives and our children, or are we exercising it in relation to it all being about me? I wonder, men, are we actually giving our a bumpy ride with this? Because we ourselves need a tune-up in this area. Now, I want to say to you, it does trouble me a little to even raise this theme for the simple reason that some men love to hear this sort of stuff because they think that this gives them then the license to treat their wives and their families any way they want. And they will take, and I know this is a danger, they will take from this today what they want to hear and that then will be what they use to justify their harsh, insensitive leadership style and they will hide behind and they will say, well, here it is, dear. It says the wife is head. Sorry, the head is wife. The head, the husband, I'm getting myself mixed up, is head of the wife. I realize that that is a danger. That's always a danger when you preach. People can take what they want to hear and apply it in the way... But that shouldn't stop you from preaching. That's what I've come to conclude. My responsibility is to seek to declare faithfully God's word. Your responsibility is to seek to receive it as a Berean and to put it into practice. And so if we understand our responsibility, largely a lot of these errors will be avoided. I suspect though, friends, that that's actually not the fault that most of us as husbands have here this morning. God knows we do actually need this bit of marriage maintenance because we often are a bit sluggish in the offtake, aren't we men? Our main problem is not that our leadership of wives is brutal, but that we are often far too passive. That rather than putting our foot down and bringing that thing to a halt, we're asleep at the wheel. Or rather than pressing the other pedal down and the initiative, we back off and we let our wives lead or we let our children, our young people lead on issues because we just want peace, which in the end is not actually true peace, fruit of the Spirit. Some, I think, Christian men hide behind what others may even say about them when they see them in public and say, oh, him, isn't he a nice guy? And meanwhile at home, Mr. Lovely Christian Man has let go of the steering wheel and taken a back seat in his marriage. Isn't that what happened at the very beginning? Think back to the Garden of Eden. Adam let go of the wheel. Instead of assertively assertively standing at the forefront of his mouth and talking nose to nose with that crafty serpent, he, he sat back, as it were, and let Eve do all the talking. And then when Eve gave her husband that fruit, instead of standing up like a man and boldly refusing to transgress God's word, he passively caved in to his wife. Adam actually cursed his family. Adam let go of the wheel. And we all know the result of that. No longer a happy home in Eden. You see, the Genesis portrait epitomizes, I think, marriages, even with Christians. And it's our fault, men. We've got to reject the world's philosophies and the world's counsels and we've got to return to God's manual. Without apology, the Bible teaches that the man is to be the leader in his marriage and in his home. And there is no question that this is an awesome responsibility. But it is one that the Spirit-filled man can embrace and will embrace when he's filled with the Spirit. Remember the, remember the context, brethren? Remember the context of Ephesians' previous verses? Paul is actually showing us what a spirit-filled husband will be like. He will be a faithful steward of his role and his function as the head of his wife and the head of his family. 
Now, I want us to think for a few moments of how this actually comes about. Like how someone becomes of a family. I want us to think this through biblically and practically. That, that means that we're not basing our thinking on our own experience in our own courtship. We're not to base our thinking on, on what we thought that sort of worked for us. We ought not to be basing our, our thinking in, in terms of the world's ways of doing things. But we need to be opening up the manual and seeing what is the biblical way of thinking on a practical level. God has appointed the husband to the office of laying the foundation in each new family which is formed. If you look down in Ephesians 5, we'll, we'll just dart on it here for the moment. Verse 31, where Paul does take us back to Eden, takes us back to Genesis. He says there, quoting in verse 31, A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The man, see who's operating here, the man shall leave. It is God's appointed purpose that a man should take the initiative. You remember that proverb that says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing? That speaks of the man initiating, the man pursuing, the man finding the other way round. So you young ladies, remember that. Be patient. Be prayerful. Don't think that you've got to get the thing happening. God's ways are the best way. And when the man is ready, when the young man is ready, and he is able to function as head of a new family unit, think what that means, biblically, that he is able to provide for his wife in a responsible way, that he is competent to protect that woman, to take her under his wing, if you will, that he is able to preserve her, that he is able to function as her prophet, that's all part of the role of being the head. When he's ready for that, and the current head of the young single lady, ordinarily her dad, he can see that, and therefore he gives his permission to happen. The young man takes the initiative. He separates himself from his parents. He takes the young lady to himself as his wife, and there is formed a new family. A man, verse 31, shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one. The new family unit is established with a new head in its place. The man has taken on a task then that he is to continue until his dying day because the husband is head of his wife. Not just on the day he says, I do, when he makes that promise, but right until the day where she has to be there seeing him die or other way around. So it's it's that that stays with us in terms of our practical stewardship that we will answer to him when it comes to this. Now the big question is, the big question that I want us to come to now is what type of leader is a spirit-filled husband to be in his marriage and family. Let's look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Now, I know it says other things, but let's just stop right there. Each word is given by inspiration of the Spirit of God. Each word is here deliberately. Each word is significant. Each has meaning. Each word has some measure of application to us. Husbands, love. Just let that sit there for a bit. Husbands, you must love. You must love your wife. Friends, the first command in this passage for the husband is not to be the head. It's for the husband to love his wife. This is a present tense command. In other words, here is the godly man's continual, habitual action. This is to be 
the dominating characteristic of the husband's leadership? Love. If we grasp this, if God helps us to live this, this is life transforming. The dominating characteristic of the husband's leadership is biblical love. You see, man, if we would truly grasp this and live this, it will overcome any tendency to tyranny and harshness in our leadership that shows itself sometimes. Love will be the accelerant to prod us out of our passivity into grace assertiveness. Love is to be the thing then that permeates the husband's leadership with his wife and family. Use the analogy of the car again. Think of love. It is to be the spiritual oil that lubricates every part of his role, that works its way into every corner of the engine of that family unit. It is the dominating characteristic of the man whom God has put to lead. And so therefore, it should work its way out into every part and every nook and every of the family unit. What happens if you never check the oil in your car and the oil runs out? You know, it runs dry. What happens? Well, I'm not a mechanic and I can't tell you all that's going to happen, but I know enough that you've got a pretty big problem. With no or little love, a husband's headship will sooner or later, use the analogy, blow its gasket, possibly crack the head. Love is essential. It is essential. You see, men, God is calling us today to check the level of the oil of love in our leadership. Also say, love also functions as the anti-corrosion coolant in the radiator of our marriages. It helps when things get overheated. It helps when things tend to be frozen. It's the husband's role to initiate love. His headship must have this dominating characteristic because without it, to some measure, there will come corrosion in the marriage and the family unit. But what is love like? What is this thing that is to dominate and permeate our leadership? Don't let the world's definition confuse us here. Don't let the philosophy of this age define what this means. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. What is love? Love is patient. Love is long. Love is immensely kind. Men, love does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. True love doesn't say, it's me time. Love does not seek its own. It is not provoked by her. Love thinks no evil of her. Love will bear all things when it comes to her. Love will hope for all things when it comes for her. Love will endure all things when it comes to you. God has given you. That's love, according to the Bible. Love is the anti-corrosion coolant in the radiator of our marriages. Men, do we need a top up today? We check the levels lately. We need a sense, a flushing through on this, a renewal of these things. Well, God in his kindness is helping us, isn't he? This marriage maintenance that he's taking us through as his people as we go through this passage. We see then something, firstly, of the matter of headship in this passage. Very briefly, I want you to notice with me, all for headship. We've already touched on this, but let's state it as we think about it now in this setting. The model for headship. Verse 23, the husband is head of the wife, 
as also Christ is head of the church and he is saviour of the body. As we've previously seen in a previous study, the wife's task is far from easy. That task of submission. And we sought to be realistic. And remember that passage in Peter. We sought to see how extremely difficult it is sometimes for a wife to submit to her husband, especially when he has men carnality in his leadership. So we state that, right? It's not easy for a wife. It can be extremely difficult for her to submit. Yet, by comparison with what is required of husbands, I would suggest, And I know I run a risk here, stoned. But I would suggest that wives have a relatively easy lot. And now immediately you ladies say, we do? Well, obviously you're not a woman. You don't know what I have to put up with. Let's think biblically. It's one thing for the wife to exemplify the church relationship to Christ, which is the passage. That relationship... The church to Christ ought to be perfect, but we all know it is far from perfect in this world. Now think of the man. Think of headship in verse 23. The headship of Christ is perfect now. He is always wise. He is always loving. He is always consistent as head of his bride. And as human husbands, that's our standard. Christ. He's the model for us to follow. The husband is head of the wife, so also Christ is head of the church. Now perhaps as a husband this morning you think, oh man, this is getting a bit heavy. I don't think I'll come next time. I mean, this is just too much for me. I know my own heart. I know I'm a sinful man. I know I am really a weak man. And this is just too much. Well, my brother, you are absolutely right. I'm with you. It is too much. Not one of us can do this in our own strength. Mind you again of the context. Paul, in the previous verses, is directing us to be filled with the Spirit. Like the wife submitting to an imperfect husband, she must be filled with the Spirit. And here we see how the husband must be filled with the Spirit if ever he is to follow Christ's perfect And don't forget verse 21. Remember it? Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now some want to play this note as the dominating note of the whole rest of what he says and will erase everything else of what he says. But Paul doesn't do that. This is not inconsistent. But he is speaking to the men here in verse 21 as much as he's speaking to the women. You see, the Christian man must have a humble. He must have a yielding spirit to everyone. That even includes his own wife. And he can be that without contradicting what the next verse says he is. Where will that spring from? Where will that spirit of humility and that willingness to yield to others spring from? Well, it must spring from a submissive and a work heart to the Lord. I remind you of what verse 21 says in the second half. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. And so as we said this in relation to the wives, we say this in relation to we who are husbands as well. Until the relationship is right vertically, men, it'll never be right horizontally. No matter what you've done over the years in your marriage, and you've got through, praise God, but until you are right vertically, you will never be right horizontally in your relationships. Not according to God's standard anyway. God conquers the man's heart in conversion. He can never be the husband his wife needs him to be based on this pattern. And if the Christian man is not walking close with God, if he is not maintaining a heart of humility with his Lord, if he is not living a life of work in reverence to Christ, he can never follow the model of Christ, the perfect head for his bride, of his bride. And yet, friends, 
when there is the filling of God's Spirit, when there is, by the grace of God, a heart in submission to Him, the Lord will give the the weakest of we men to exemplify and to imitate God's Son in His headship of our bride. And so we touch on then the model for headship. Let's move now as we open up the first part of this today, the manner of headship. Taking the question really here, in what way is the husband to be exercising loving leadership or leadership with his wife and family? Verse 25 gives us something of an answer, as we've already said. Husbands, love your wives just as, is the model, Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for them. Husbands, you've got to love. You have to. It's not optional. You're commanded to. You're ahead. That's that's your position. It's not optional. That's your. And as part of that position in leadership, we are to love. Not like the world. Just as Christ loved the church. How did he love the church? Well, there are many things to say, and the first obvious thing we should say is the love that Jesus had for his bride is a special love. Now, now it's obviously true, we know the Bible teaches that God has a general love for all mankind. He does send the rain on the just and the unjust, on those who he pardons, those who are not forgiven. God in his love has a general love for all mankind, yes. But God has a special love for his people. A special love for his own bride. Love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church. There's a, there's a particular thing being addressed here, not a general thing. Christ also loved the church. He has a special love for his bride. And yes, the husband. He is, he is to reflect God. He is, he is to have a love for all men, all his fellow neighbours, all people. He has to love even for his enemies as a Christian man. Yes, he has to have a general love. He has to love his entire family. He has to love each child. But he has a special love for his wife. It's a special love. Just as Christ loved the church. That special love we know in the Bible, it teaches us The special love that Christ has for his bride is actually an eternal love. It's not just special, it's eternal. You remember, it's been back months ago, back in Ephesians chapter 1, we saw that God set his love on his bride before time. That special love of the divine groom for his bride, it will never end. The end of Romans chapter 8 is very clear. It tells us that nothing can separate the love of God for his bride. That is, it says at the end of that chapter, those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus doesn't get to some point and say, oh, well, I used to love them. But I fell out of love. Oh, she has treated me like this. And because she has treated me like this, I no longer feel an obligation to love her anymore. Is that how Jesus thinks? Is that the love of Jesus for his bride? No, his is an eternal love. And so the human husband's love is not temporary. It is not what I just said. It is not, well, we used to love each other. But somewhere along the line, I don't quite know where it happened, but I just fell out of love. Men, we don't have that option. God's thinking. Our love is to continue on. Now, it's different in this sense. When death separates the husband and wife, that relationship has come to an end. So it's, it's not eternal like Christ in that sense, but in, term of, in terms of it not being in this world, it's the same. 
Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. His love is special. His love is eternal. It's not some temporary thing. And now let's come to the very thing the passage actually specifically tells us as we come to the end. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave self for her. It is sacrificial love. Did our Saviour come down to his earthly bride? and recline on the sofa and expect her to bring him his slippers and a cup of tea. No, it's the opposite. He came and he emptied himself out for her good and her benefit. Mark 10.45 says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. And so ultimately, Christ-like leadership is servant leadership. It's a sacrificial leadership that is loving. Now, did Christ's bride, did she deserve that love? Was it the case that the bride of Christ is just so beautiful... I mean, she is just so attractive and so compelling that Jesus couldn't resist to love her. Is that the Bible's teaching? Does chapter 5 tell us? Let's let the Bible tell us the answer. Romans 5 says something about how attractive the bride was or not. Verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in time Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10 refers to his bride as his enemy, hostility in her heart toward him. You see? What type of bride we were? We were an ugly, unattractive bride. There was no merit in us that that would catch Jesus' groom out. You see, such love is not dependent upon physical appearance. So much of that is the world's thinking. Such love is not dependent of some other aspect of attraction. This love is in the end not about the object. It's about the heart of the one who expresses that love. And so men, even if our wives treat us in a way that's to some degree similar to how we treated Christ, we are still to love. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her and what was she like? She was pretty ugly and nasty and rebellious. It's, this love has got nothing to do with what is deserved. We know that as Christians. Christ's love for his bride was a sacrificial love. It is a dying to self. It's the loving leadership that God calls we who are husbands to. You think about it in terms of the gospel, in terms of Jesus. It was for his bride he left heaven's glory. For his bride, he was willing to wiggle in a manger as a little babe. For his bride, he was willing to walk in a crooked world. For his bride, he endured and and fierce satanic temptation in the wilderness. For his bride, he absorbed years of rejection. For his bride, he had nowhere to lay his head. For his bride, he marched knowingly, fearlessly to the Jerusalem slaughterhouse. For his bride... He was drenched in in tears in Gethsemane and said, Not my will be done, but yours, Father. It was for his bride that he was falsely accused and suffered an agonizing and humiliating death in public, naked. For her, flesh was pierced. For his bride, Paul tells us, his blood was shed. For her, this husband hung there before scoffing fools. For his bride, he gasped for breath on the cross 
and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was for his bride. He finished it. And he breathed his last. And he died. Selfless sacrifice. Husbands, that's our model. It's the manner of loving leadership, even for an unresponsive, undeserving bride. Here's how to lead your wife, men, in sacrificial love. Dying to your own wants, dying to your own desires. When was the last time, husbands, you actually made a sacrifice for your wife, a conscious sacrifice? So, oh, why was this last week? It was Valentine's Day. That's nice. When did you go out of the way to deliberately do that which would be for her good and benefit? Smooth running marriage demands this profound Christ-like self-abandonment. Love does not seek its own. And so the challenge meant for us by the Spirit is to put to death selfishness that constantly rises in our hearts. You probably heard it. The world likes to talk about these days the need for us to have me time. Well, your career is ultimate. Your mortgage is already now. Friends, we can't mix fuels if the motor of marriage is going to run to its ultimate performance. We can't think that it will work to take a bit of the world's ideas and a bit of God's ideas and, and, and mix those fuels. It will give a bad performance. It will lead to very poor mileage in progress in our relationship. We need this family maintenance. We, we need, don't we, the marriage manual. Christian leadership, it's not about tyrannizing. It's not about domineering. It's not about many... Christian leaders... Lead by loving. Love takes the initiative. Christ-like love is special. It's, it's lasting love. It's, it's undeserving love and it's sacrificial love. And I'm sure it's abundantly clear that the only way that any man could love like this is by God's grace. By being filled with His Spirit. That we each need humble hearts, hearts that are in submission to Christ. Hearts that, that love and reverence Him. You see, men, we said this with the, with the ladies a few weeks ago. Now it's applying for... This is actually part of our daily worship of Christ. What we're speaking of this morning. Not just our personal devotions every day. But, but living out what it means to be a Christian man in my home before my children in my marriage. It's another in the reverence of God. Can you see if God gives you ladies this type of man as a husband that every day on a very practical down to earth level the gospel is being demonstrated in your home before those other watching eyes. A marriage like this surely is a powerful gospel testimony for anyone who will see it. Young ladies, this is the type of man you can pray for now that God may give you one of these men. Let me share with you. I, I can remember, I don't remember how old I was, but I, I can remember praying for my wife Years before I ever met her. Obviously, I couldn't pray for her by name, <laughs> but I prayed for her. Young ladies, you can pray for this man, that God would keep him pure, that God would mould him now. You pray it now as a, as a girl, that God would give you one of these men. Parents, 
Here's it which God places before us in raising our sons under his blessing to become such men as these. And yet we all feel the weight of it, don't we? And so where does the weight, well, where should the weight take us? When we're pressed down and feel the weight of our sons, where does that take us? It puts us down on our knees. And there on our knees can plead that God might work in our marriages and work in our hearts as men to help each of you wives to encourage your man to be like Jesus and to pray for him to become like him. Friends, in the end, a husband like the one presented before us in Ephesians 5.25, a marriage like this is only possible because in the first place, Christ loved his bride and he gave his life for her. It's Christ we need. Filled with his spirit. Each of us, whether we are the lady or the man in the house, each of us with our eyes fixed upon Christ. The road to marital and God's glory, the road to Christ-like leadership is the way of the cross. Each of us need to be reminded of Christ's self-sacrifice for undeserving sinners, just like us, which is what we're going to do in a moment as we come around the Lord's table. Let's pray together.